Hello and welcome to another episode. I'm coming at you from Chongqing today and I'm together with Cordell, who I've known for, must be like three, four years now, I think. Yeah, yeah for sure. I yeah. want to say, what, 2015, 2016? Somewhere around there, yeah. And the last yeah. time I saw you were, was like a year ago or so, or two years ago in... Uh, yeah, when I was down in Shenzhen. Right, uh, yeah. That had to be... 2017, right before I went back to the States. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. But you're back here now in Chongqing. Yep, enjoying, so, it, enjoying it. Yeah, that's good. So how about you introduce yourself first, where you're from and okay. your story, how you got here. So I was born in Florida. Uh, me, my younger brother, older brother, and uh, my parents, we migrated up north to, uh, to New York in about 2000, December. And uh, that's where basically I, I grew up. So I'm a New York State guy. And like most other New Yorkers, you know, I guess you're not really a New Yorker. You just kind of migrate there and <laughs> yeah. become a New Yorker. Uh, so I identify as, as such, the a New York guy. Uh, and I uh, did my undergraduate in uh, upstate New York, did my master's overseas in uh, Brussels, and now I'm here doing my PhD in Chongqing. Nice. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, upstate New York. Where in upstate New York? Was uh, it Orange Syrac County, New York. Oh, okay. Okay. All yeah, right. So we've got like the Middletown area, Newburgh, Poughkeepsie. Uh, it's a very interesting place. You know, it's like it's got a bunch of different blends of the suburban and rural areas. So you can get all the, the city lifestyle kind of blended in with the cows, farms, and mountains. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> It's really yeah. good stuff. And New York City is not that far away, so All that's right. where you spend the weekends. And so now you're doing, you're doing your PhD in economics here in Chongqing, yep, yep. and you're doing it all in Chinese, too. All in Chinese. Ri the yeah. writing, everything. So I, I get the leeway of writing my essays in English uh, because uh, basically a lot, most of the international journals, they want entries in English, so my professors don't mind me writing in English. For my exams, that's the uh, the struggle because oh, wow. okay. you know reading and writing in Chinese, I feel as though probably the most difficult task. Uh, for yeah. me, that was where I started uh, learning Chinese when I first got here in November 2013. Uh, it's like everyone tells you, if you want to know Chinese, you can learn how to speak pretty easily, but you know if you don't learn how to read and write, there's a certain level where you just can't go any further. Right. And luckily, that's where I started because that's where I still struggle a little, a little bit. And uh, with my exams, man, sometimes I'm just sitting there like, okay, I'm going to write down a couple of notes here, do a little bit of practice sessions before the exams. Because when you sit down and, you know, you've got to read, uh, let's say, uh, three or four topic questions and then write about 400 characters per response at, at minimum. So that, that for me was probably like the hardest challenge. But yeah, I'm so far enjoying it a lot. And uh, yeah, it's yeah. an experience. That would, that would yeah. be. So now, um, is, is, so you're studying economics here in PhD. I don't know if you've been able to compare notes with uh, people who are doing a similar thing back in the U.S. But are there any differences with studying economics here to there or well, other than the language? Or is it uh, all pretty much the same thing? Of course, the language uh, barrier, I would say, is the, the main key difference. But in terms of the content. Uh, like, the con content wise, uh, I feel as though there's a lot more specialization here. Uh, so, for example, my microeconomics course, uh, generally, my professor focuses strictly on game theory. So we're spending, uh, let's say, three to six lectures going strictly down the game theory rabbit hole. And, you know, it can be a little bit complicated when you're learning all of these new, uh, let's say, terms and techniques, like the specialized characters in Chinese. Uh, but otherwise, you know, uh, I would say it's quite similar. Um, uh, on the other hand, the one difficulty I would say is the historical context of it. So for me, I found that being the only foreigner in most of my courses, uh, sitting there listening to my lectures, muse about their vacations and their trips to foreign countries uh, that are developing similar to China in the same range, that uh, the stories they were telling to the students are very different from the stories you would hear from an economics professor in the U.S. or in, okay. in the U.K. or uh, in Europe. I, I suppose there would there'd probably be a variance mm. um, between professor to professor even within the US right, but there's right, right. an additional element here where you're gonna get quite Indeed. a unique uh, yeah perspective from China yeah it's, it's very cool because like for me I find that uh, every day I get to take bits and pieces from each of my colleagues uh, some of my PhD colleagues but also some of the students who yeah. I, I bump into during the day uh, and I get to find out what it is that drove them to learn economics and what they've been learning for the past 10, 12 years of their studies and compare them with my own experiences. Oh, okay, too. yeah, that's so, a useful. And, and I think that's the, the most fascinating part about my personal education. It's like I spent uh, my undergraduate in uh, the first two years in Immaculata University in Pennsylvania and then the last two years where I graduated from uh, Siena College in Albany. Uh, so for me, the experience of going from New York to uh, the University of Kent, uh, Canterbury, and living on the Brussels campus, and now doing my PhD here in China, I'm able to see the differences between the three education systems right. in the U.S., yeah. uh, Europe, and here in China. Yeah. And, I, and I feel as though what I've been able to identify is that 
in the U.S., there's like a broader range of being able to understand that there is more than one way to skin a cat, so to speak. You know, I'm going to give you this uh, complex answer, and I want you to give me your personal analysis on how to get from A to Z, so to speak. And that that ability is uh, it's critical. It's it's critical thinking. It's uh, necessary for you to be able to understand how to solve complex problems by taking your own personal journey to uh, the exam. Whereas, uh, I'll jump ahead to the PhD comparison right. here. Uh, what I've found is that generally they're asking questions that have one answer to it. And if you here. Don't, yes. And if you don't know the answer to that one question, you cannot be correct. So okay. I find that that's a very interesting way to, to learn because it, it's, uh, to give you a concrete example, uh, if we're talking about uh, something like developing a spaceship that has to go to the moon, mm -hmm. there's only one right way to do certain procedures that are going to help you develop a rocket, for example, right? There's no, oh, well, let's try to do it this way. It's like, if we know that these are the calculations that are going to get us to the moon, these are the calculations. So it's kind of working backwards in the concept of saying, this is the answer, how do you get to it? So, so it's not necessarily that they're taking problems that should have multiple answers. They're mm -hmm. focusing on issues that really only have one answer. Exactly, and, exactly. Yeah. and, and it's, it's a different way to learn, but I feel as though it's, uh, it's very fascinating for me because at the same time, I also used to teach at the university, one of the universities here and from my experience I was able to help my students understand that there are different ways to solve problems but you also have to be aware that if you're going to solve complex problems you need to know that uh, if you're wrong you're wrong right yeah, <laughs> like yeah. it's plain and simple so I think it's, that's it's, something it's, I think that is yeah. lost with um, it, actually move, scoot your mic in a little bit closer yeah, to sure. you I, or, that's what I think is lost with um, or we've gone in a certain direction overseas where a lot of the, the, the curriculum is designed around, well, there's no wrong answer. Exactly, there's no exactly. wrong question. There's well, well, sometimes there are. This is 100% <laughs> you know? correct. Because, for example, uh, the liberal arts designed education is to make sure you get a well-rounded uh, study to, to get uh, your experience with history, with English literature, with the sciences, hard sciences and social sciences, and to take that information and to build a foundation. Uh, but I can tell you from my personal experience with some of the kids I went to school with, they were taking advantage of that. Yeah. It's like, of course, you're going to class, pass, fail, and, you know, you're picking up as little as possible to make sure you get a passing grade. And that information may be lost on you. Whereas right. your cor courses, you actually have to know that information to succeed in the future. And I think that uh, there's something that there's something to this style of saying the the way to get to this answer is by doing exactly what your professor is telling you. And if you can't figure out how to do that, then you're going to fail this course. And yeah. I think there's some, there's a lot of um, complexity in trying to figure out how to merge those two versions of the system. And, you know, I think we'll slowly get there as a society in the U.S., for example, but uh, we'll see. We'll see how it plays yeah, out. Yeah, and, and actually, I, I kind of want to back things up a little bit because, yeah. I mean, some of the things you're talking about, I, I think somebody who doesn't study economics, they mm. probably don't know what's really involved. So mm. what is studying economics? So, I mean, you're talking about game theory. Right. There's probably, like, statistics involved, I would suppose. Yes, yes, yes. And, uh, I mean, uh, how about you explain, like, what is studying economics? Let me give you my preference for understanding economics in a simple way because okay. one of the reasons why I study economics is because I realize that we've gotten to the point where talking about abstract mathematical models is something that only experts understand. So I want to uh, be the type of economist or the type of social scientist who can deliver information that my parents can understand. I don't want to put a piece of paper in front of them to say that this specific study can explain to you how to have your budget function from month A to month C. Yeah. From the first quarter of the year to this quarter. You want to simplify it, things down. And they're saying, okay, I'm looking at this and I'm reading it, but I don't understand it. Yeah. So for example, I want to be able to sit down and say, I want to show you how you can save your money and have more money at the end of the year. Right, yeah. <laughs> it's plain and simple like this. Yeah, that's, I mean, that ties so, into what Einstein says, right? Einstein right. says, you know, intelligence isn't taking a simple problem and making it complex. They, they, Indeed. It's Indeed. taking a complex problem and making it simple. Exactly. That's what so, you're embracing here. Uh, to the economics question, for me, studying economics is how do we manage resources? The scarcity effect. Like, we're slowly running out of resources. How do you manage them? What are we going to do in the future as a society, as a global society, to make sure that we can work together to solve problems? So for me, uh, what I've learned so far in my university studies here uh, is mostly a lot of mathematics, uh, statistical regressions, figuring out how to solve problems by using different mathematical models that take the real world into an abstract model. Uh, for me, what I'm taking from that is I have to do these specific things to pass my courses. 
What I'm able to do, though, uh, towards my goal of making sure that I'm doing economics, doing economics the way that my parents can understand it is utilizing these techniques and also merging them with my uh, with my studies as a political scientist, my undergraduate and saying, OK, how can I put these two things together and bridge that gap so that way I can write about these abstractions or take these techniques and utilize them to give you the information as raw and simple as possible in a way that's easy to understand. And I think that's by saying, OK, what are the problems that we're facing today? Uh, for example, uh, future of automation and technology is my field of study, my specialization. Okay. And that looks at labor, uh, labor shortages and unemployment. So what do we do about unemployment when automation kicks into effect? When we start thinking about things like 60 to 70 percent unemployment and how do we tackle that problem? You can talk to people about things like job retraining and you can abstract that and tell them about the complexities of, say, well, you know, automation is going to take this percent of these jobs and this percent of these jobs. And if we do this mathematical regression, we can explain the problem like this. Who's going to understand that? A specific number of people who are trained to understand those things. What I want to do is say, OK, we're looking at this sector and we're looking at this sector. For example, uh, the service sector like McDonald's. If we're going to replace uh, the servers and the people who are making the fries in the back, this is what we're looking at as the future. What are we going to do with those people who are working in this place? And how are we going to help them exist in a society where the person who's making the fries in the back is trying to pay for their college education. The person who's a server in the front might be a mother, a single mother of two. What can we do to make sure that these people aren't outside of the uh, working population when those jobs used to sustain people while they were trying to get somewhere else? And like for me, I want to figure out ways to uh, draw attention to those problems, but also make sure that people understand what the solutions look like in plain English. Right. So that that's it makes me think about Andrew Yang. Yeah. Uh, yeah right. Yeah, so yeah. because that's one of the things he talks about a lot, right? Mm -hmm. And so I mean, I, I I'm not following um, his campaign very closely, right. but the, the solution I've heard from him is the freedom dividend. Right. Right. And right. Uh, I mean, I don't know if that really addresses the entire problem, but is yeah, is, is he on the right track thinking about these kinds of things? I, I think he's on the right track in the sense that. If we're going to talk about these problems, we need to be talking about solutions because solutions are what are going to help us figure out whether or not something can work or whether it's not going to work at all. And if we try new things, we'll have uh, we'll at least have the information to say, OK, we tried this and it didn't work. Let's try something else. But I feel as though knocking down ideas like uh, universal basic income, UBI and the freedom dividend up front without actually giving them a shot to work. That's where we go wrong as a society. Right. So I, I, I think that. Uh, that's one of the greatest values of his campaign is that he's putting some of these ideas in the forefront. Bringing it to attention. Exactly, because I know in, uh, in Stockton, California, uh, Michael Tubbs, I believe the mayor, uh, is doing a test run with the UBI. And I f believe there's another uh, example of this being done in one of the Nordic countries. And I think they may have just suspended it recently. But if we're testing these things out, we at least have some raw information to be able to say, okay, well, you know what? Uh, these are some of the downsides of it. These are some of the upsides of it. Can we improve this system? Can we adapt it to this market, to this society? Are there other ways we could be doing UBI that are going to, that's, that's sustainable in a place like the United States? Because it's a very complex uh, system. It's a complex structure. And you, know, you can't uh, look at the United States and say, just because it works in California, it'll work in Idaho yeah. and Wisconsin. I think they're doing it in Alaska also, right? I think um, there's some sort I'm of- I'm not sure, but I know I, Alaska has a, I, I forget the exact name of it, but they have some sort of oil yeah. dividend. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so like then from, from Macau, like Macau, they have yeah. uh, the similar kind of thing. In Macau, mm -hmm. they, they share the, some of the casino right, revenues exactly. and taxes. So it's like, you know, people. the people are, you know, they're, they're okay. They're yeah. comfortable. It's like, you and know, I mean, with, with, with Macau, I mean, it's still a very productive society <laughs> yeah. and stuff like mm -hmm. that. So there are examples to yeah. draw from. You know, I, I it, it makes me think more about this issue because I have a really good friend in Shenzhen. He's a mm -hmm. Canadian um, who is really into technology also. And he was talking to me about this big problem of AI coming in automation. And I kind of marginalized his opinion in the beginning. I was kind mm. of like, oh, come on. You know what? We always yeah. say there's always something new. You know, right, right, like right. there's always the Luddite who says, mm. you know, the, the sky is falling and we always figure it out. Right. And he's like, no, it's different this time. I said, they always say that too. Mm. But, you know, it really does actually seem a little bit different this time. Yeah, I, I think it's true. I think we're, we're getting closer to that point in time where we need to address these issues. And yeah. we need to kind of break down the levees and kind of let the floodgates, uh, let, let the floodgates down and, you know, see what change looks like. But while we're letting this change happen, we need to also be thinking about what the ramifications of these uh, technologies are going to be and how we're going to address this change. And I think that's the key is saying, OK, we constantly are looking at new technologies disrupting markets, disrupting societies and disrupting cultures. What are we going to do 
with this uh, future that we perceive. And, and we can never be 100% right. It's about not, not being right, but being right enough, finding the right solutions and not letting perfect be the enemy of good. And it's like, we need to look at how can we sustain as a society when we can become more efficient as a society, more efficient as a people by implementing these technologies in certain areas. Uh, one of my favorite uh, parts of my research is I'm always looking at uh, when I was a little kid riding through toll booths, and you and I spoke about this prior yeah. the other day, and it's like toll booths, uh, grocery stores, and certain gas station uh, convenience stores where you're starting to see machines replace people where they used to be. You know, you go through a toll booth as a little kid and you're sitting in their car like, wait, why do we stop? And you like wake up out of that little <laughs> haze and you're like, oh, we're at a toll booth and you just see tons of cars just yeah. waiting in line. And now in New York State, for example, you're driving through the toll booths and you don't even recognize them unless you're the driver, you know, because they're just a tower with cameras yeah. on it. And it's like those jobs are slowly just being eliminated. Well, you know, you know, you know what's interesting, too, though, is like bringing in a little bit of a China topic since we're yeah. here is you, you, what I found is like living in Canada. Also, there's so many things you see mm. and, you know, technology has come out. Right. And you ask yourself the question you, very often in Canada and the U.S., why isn't this automated? Mm. This is mm. so easy. Whereas here, they automate it before you even think of it. And, yes, and it's true. like it, something becomes automated. You're like, oh, damn, yeah, that was yeah, a good that, idea. That, this, Of course this should be automated. That is true. And I think you'll start to see that more often here as well. And I think this is um, an adoption principle. Uh, in the U.S., we, we struggle with adoption of new technologies for security risks or whatever, what have you. Whereas here... Uh, the society is still developing. So it's easier for people to say, wow, that changes the way I do my day-to-day -day business. Let me implement that. And one of the, the most uh, exciting things, I think, is mobile technologies, mobile phones. You see people are more apt to pick up a smartphone here uh, in all age groups uh, as, yeah. a, as a, compared to a place like the States. Um, you know, my mother just started texting about 10 years ago. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it took her a, a long time to transition from using a flip phone to an iPhone. Whereas here... You know, I'm sitting on the metro and I look up and everyone from age yeah. uh, 10 to 70 and 80, they all have smartphones. Oh, yeah, and yeah. Everyone's just kind of like jamming out. You know, yeah, we, we, bought, we bought some little uh, baby shoes from a street seller. Old mm -hmm. lady, she must have been like in her 70s or something like right. that. Yeah, pulls out her phone and we pay her by WeChat. <laughs> yeah, it's like, yeah, that's yeah. what you do here. Yeah, and I think that's it's pretty cool because um, uh, a good example of that is when I arrived in November 2013, uh, they were just implementing the credit card, debit card uh, swiping machines. And it was really frustrating for me because I just got here from Brussels and New York and back and forth. So now I'm in Chongqing and I'm either in New York, never using cash or in Europe, I'm always using cash. And okay. I get here. So I'm trying to use my debit card again and I have my Chinese bank account and I just can't find anywhere to use my debit card. So I have to constantly go find a bank, take my money out. And when I would use my debit card, they're like, oh, hey, sorry, we don't do that yet. And this went on for months. So I'm always carrying a lot of cash on me. And within the span of about six or eight months, I want to say in 2014, you start seeing WeChat pay and essentially they leapfrogged the entire technology yeah. of debit credit. And, you know, in the U.S. and Canada, it was like a really big thing, like when credit cards came out and that, that momentum shifted to Europe where you started seeing all these American Express commercials. And it was quite a fascinating thing to, to, to see and even to read about now in history. And you see how uh, essentially mobile payment technologies have leapfrogged that and no one here uses debit cards. It's just WeChat Pay, and I think that's pretty cool. Well, yeah, that's an interesting thing to think about, though, is that, you know, so, I mean, first of all, obviously, there's the element of this is such a new society to begin with in terms of right, opening right. up, um, but nobody really gets time to get used to anything here. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, you, you don't get too comfortable because it's like, <laughs> we just had this thing, so no problem, let's right. change the next thing. And so it's like people in the U.S. and Canada, they're used to debit cards, they're used to credit cards, mm. and then probably to, to compound that, <clears throat> excuse me, is... You've got those big companies behind that who have a Indeed. vested interest to make right. sure that you don't move away from this stuff. Right. And those vertical and horizontal supply chains kind of, you know, ingrain them into our societies as well. So people are just thinking to themselves, you know, I don't think I'm going to give this up. And our marketing advertising game is really, really strong in the U.S. too. I think that's kind of the key is allowing people to say, well, I've been doing this for so long. Why should I give this up? And I think, you know, it kind of ingrains industries into our culture in a way, whereas here, a lot of the technologies, for example, WeChat is a Chinese company selling Chinese goods to Chinese people, Chinese services. And I think it's, uh, it's pretty fascinating. So I really look forward to spending time here because, you know, I tell all of my friends, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity to live in a society like this where it's constantly evolving and technologies are constantly shifting. Yeah, really light do speed. Things. And it's like overnight, you'll just see a transition in the entire WeChat apparatus is just like 
you know, it, it evolves threefold. And it's, it's amazing to see that. Yeah, I mean, especially studying what you're studying. I mean, where is there a better place on earth to yeah, see this unfold? Exactly. Uh, yeah, 100% right. 100% right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I think it's impossible to, to downplay that because, you know, that was one of the upsides to me making my decision to do my PhD here because, you know, I've already built the foundation with my research and my studies uh, since about, I want to say around 2012. So when I decided to do my PhD, I looked in about four different countries and once i'd been living here for such a long time i kind of made the decision that uh my research isn't going to be altered by spending time here uh, my experiences are going to change which gives me a different perspective and my training prior to studying here is not going to be altered it, it'll only be enhanced so for me to be able to witness uh, the transition from uh, these combustion engine vehicles to these green vehicles that we see driving by in Chongqing every day. That's not something you can see in, in upstate New York uh, or in anywhere in the U.S. at the moment where you're just seeing constantly new vehicles on the road that yeah. weren't there. A yeah, prior. yeah. I mean, it's, New York, New York City has a plan to change to all electric buses, right, 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 and it's right. like a 20 or 30 year plan. Exactly. In Shenzhen, they, they came out with a plan and within mm -hmm. three years. 17,000 yeah, yeah. buses. I, I remember that because uh, I want to say I was down in Shenzhen uh, the weekend where it was happening. And I was like, man, these cars are really cool. And it's just it, it is, it's fascinating to see something like that because it's something that 20, 30, 40 years from now, kids will be reading about this in history books, how society was altered from the 20, like 2010 to 2020. Like this is a deep transition in the Chinese society. And it's just altering the future and our understanding yeah, it, of technology. Yeah, it, it really is remarkable because you know what? Even within, like, forget saying within your lifetime. Right. Within my 11 years in Shenzhen, I just yeah. can't believe it's the same city. Yeah, yeah that's crazy. You know, like, uh, the, and the high-speed rail, it, it was pretty much all built yeah. while I was here in China. 25,000 <laughs> yeah, yeah. kilometers of, yeah. of high-speed rail. Yeah. And, and, I mean, even the, the city, the sound of Shenzhen is so quiet now. I remember one of my biggest problems I had was... Um, I, I was living in an apartment above Shunan Dadao. Uh, it's the main kind of artery, the big road in Shenzhen. And the, I was on the, even on the 29th floor mm. facing that road, just I was woken up early every morning by the sounds of the buses, those mm. big, you know, the yeah, really yeah. heavy, you know, engine sounding buses. And it's gone. Yeah. It's silent. The city is silent now. Yeah. It's uh, it really is. So, I mean, mm. let, let alone a lifetime. Yeah. I mean, you, you consider like my, my wife's generation where they grew up with absolutely, so she's from, from, from China, mm. where, where she grew up with absolutely nothing, where they had yeah. to kind of ration the food between their family to now this. Right. And, and that, that was actually a real good, that was a learning experience for me too. Because I mentioned before is, you know, a lot of, a lot of foreigners, they have this uh, preconception about China. And, and I was one of them also. And even here, even after I lived in China, within right. three, three to four years of living in China, I still kind of consume my anti-Chinese news, and I was talking to my family about it. I was talking to, you know, there's a there's a movie um, uh, that's it's not available in China, but it's about the Cultural Revolution period. And I played it, and my father-in-law had to leave the room halfway through yeah. the movie. He was like, oh, "This is too real," mm. and um, and I, I showed these documentaries from these other you know so-called human rights activists, and I they still love China. There's right. like, nah, you know, and and I didn't really get into it too deep then. The only way I processed it was by saying. Man, these guys are really brainwashed. Yeah. And then I got to a point where I was like, maybe it's me who's brainwashed. <laughs> and I'm like, hold right. on a second. You know, China's done made all this progress. They've right. made all this change. They've raised hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. You know, that mm -hmm. the, 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 my father in law is happy because all of his kids have, can afford houses now. Yeah. And it's, it's really. Man, and yeah. so actually, that ties into a question that I had a, a curiosity about you deciding to study economics here. Mm -hmm. Do you have any friends back home that kind of look at you and say, what? Like, you know, kind of judge uh, you for that? Yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, to, to step back to one of the points you were making about, uh, like, your understanding of, like, China now from living here and thinking, like, having that introspective conversation with yourself about, wait, am I the one who's been yeah. watching? It's, it's really funny you say that because I feel as though that's the value of traveling to different places, is yeah. that it gives you a perspective on being able to say, you know what, before I arrived here, this is what I thought, and now my entire mindset has shifted. And I think that's not a wrong thing. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that's what more people need is to have that experience of going to a new place and saying, you know what, I'm going to let my preconceived notions kind of fall to the wayside and take advantage of this experience. And I think that's, that's what happens to most of us because when I first got here, I was exactly the same. And, uh, you know, my experience here was altered by, I want to say, the first couple of months I lived, in, uh, lived abroad in Europe where... I constantly felt like, you know, everyone knows America. That's, even though they've never been there before, they already know Americans and this kind of thing. So I didn't want to feel as though that's what I was doing when I got here. I wanted to say, okay, I'm going to have a fresh understanding of what's going on in China. Uh, 
and to answer your question, so one of the reasons why I decided to come here, and this plays into like why some of my friends are really uh, to this day still kind of like, what China? <laughs> why are you going there again? Uh, when I was doing my masters, uh, there was an experience I had with one of our students, uh, one of my classmates who was uh, living in Brussels, and he was just happening to uh, showing up to every once in a while to class. And uh, he was a Chinese guy. I'm not sure which city he was from. I never really interacted with him. But during one of our seminars, which was uh, after our courses, which normally like two and a half hours, uh, we'd have a, a seminar once a week. And in the seminars, it normally was like half the class and we'd have either have the professor or the assistant professor. And we were doing a presentation. Uh, each student had a presentation and uh, the guy who was delivering his, uh, was, his PowerPoint was uh, utilizing realism and uh, the Chinese society. And midway through the guy's presentation, uh, the guy stands up and says, you don't know China. You don't know what's going on there. You've never been there. Uh, you can't say these things. And the professor kind of stood up and was like, hey, man, you know, we have rules for the seminar. Uh, if you have questions or any complaints, you should uh, you know, register them after he's finished his presentation. And he's like, none of you know what you're talking about. You've never been to China before. And then he kind of just like, walked out. Uh, and everyone's just like, whoa, that was different. And for days, I was like, man. I've never seen anything like that before, right. especially not in a university. You know, I was like, man, I've never seen anybody do that before. And uh, about maybe two weeks after that, I was doing some research on uh, bilateral relationships between Russia and China uh, post-World War II. And I realized there was a bunch of information I couldn't find. And I kept finding uh, very simple uh, uh, constructs of what I was searching for. Like I couldn't find the meat of my, my discussion, so I had to change my topic. And it made me realize something like, man, maybe that guy had, there's something to it. Maybe everything he said, uh, maybe the way he went about saying what he said was wrong. But yeah. maybe the things, he, there was some truth to what he's saying and I should look into that. And that was what planted the seed for me to spend time in China. And initially I just wanted to come here to learn Chinese and then go do my degree in the West. And I would spend a semester or one year yeah. in China studying. And like, that's what my plan was. You ended up, and then when yeah. I came here, uh, I was able to learn Chinese by going outside and meeting people and living in the society and working in the society. And it changed, it altered my perspective on how, not I see the world, but how we all see the world in this skewed uh, vision. It's all about our perspectives, the things that we read in the news, uh, the things we see on uh, social media. All of these things mold our perspectives in ways that make it very difficult for us to be open-minded about something we don't understand. And um, one of the points the guy was making, uh, who, who yelled in the lecture hall, was that uh, the people who come from the West deserve to be paid less because they're less educated. And at the time, I'm just like, man, what is this guy talking about? Because we have similar disparities with education and uh, wage gaps in the U.S. as well. I mean, these aren't uncommon problems. And from living here, uh, looking back on that moment, I, I really think to understand what he was talking about in a completely different context. If you're talking about someone who migrates from one side of the country to another side of the country while this aspect of it is developing, there may be some forms of uh, discrimination in a, in a way, but when you're talking about this society, there are completely different layers and levels to socioeconomics in ways that we don't have in the U.S. And I think it's like a very complex argument to have, but it was a very just enlightening moment for me to see, okay, I know what he's saying. Whether or not I disagree with him or agree with him or not is a completely different story, but it was such a fascinating thing. So... You know, I went back home after I graduated in 2012, and that's when I came, uh, ended up here in 2013, as I said. And when I decided to come back here, um, to, when I decided to come here to do my PhD in 2017, and I told most of my friends, they were like, man, why are you going to China? And I tried to, I gave them the brief version of yeah. that story. And they were like, man, but that's, why? Why yeah, not yeah. just stay here in New York or go to California or, you know, <laughs> go back to the UK or to Europe? And for me, I'm thinking to myself, like, if I keep doing the same things over and over again, I will keep repeating the same structures that already exist. But I want to find ways to do things differently, to find new answers to old problems. You have to do things differently. So for me, that's my solution. Yeah, yeah. That, I mean, that's interesting. That story to me um, for a number of reasons, and uh, particularly with the student who stood up and spoke out. Mm. Because, I mean, first of all, most people might just have a tendency to just say, okay, well, that guy's crazy right, and, right, and right. put it off. But you said, okay, well, let, let me hear. This guy obviously feels really strongly about yeah. what he's saying. Let me look into it. But also from the perspective of you see this happening all the time, these Chinese students overseas getting really upset, really angry, and right. sometimes see, seeming uh, uh, irrational. And I kind of, um, I, 
I didn't really understand it in the beginning, but then when you start to really look at the narrative that's going on, you, you kind of do understand it. It's like, you know, China cannot do any good. It doesn't matter what you do. And I remember there was this um, this post that uh, was penned by a netizen in, 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 um, in China on Weibo where they listed out all these things. It's like, you know, you, you say we should have free speech, but when we speak up, you say we're brainwashed and all of this right, stuff. Right, right. And people are constantly judging China that it kind of makes people, I think, from here overreact a little bit. It's yeah. like, okay, not this again. Mm. And so I feel like what they're doing and their approach is useless. Yeah. And it's interesting for me to hear this case because in mm. your case, mm. it did do something. Right, even right, though it was right. irrational, even though he did lash out like yeah. all these other students are, mm. perhaps sometimes it does make a difference with the people that it matters where they're like, okay, Indeed. well, well let Indeed. me yeah, hear yeah. this out. Yeah, I think that's true because, you know, after spending nearly seven years here, uh, six of the last seven years here, you know, I've I've grown to understand what it is that separates our understanding of our own countries with foreign countries. It, it, and it's, you know, there's so much nuance to it where you grow up in a society, in a small town, uh, you learn certain things about that town that no one else will ever understand. Uh, the, the guys you grow up with in middle school and high school, no one will ever be able to infiltrate that fin friend group the way that you guys have built your structure. And I feel as though that's how countries are becoming, is that we've closed off our our societies from being able to understand outside groups. And I think that's something that should be addressed as well. Like we should all be aware of that. And I find that when I, during my time teaching at the university, at uh, Sichuan International Studies University, uh, I, I was able to further understand the mentality of the, the students here. You know, there's a regimented structure about how you learn and what you need to learn to be successful. And for them, uh, there's a guideline about if you follow this guideline, you'll be successful. You decide that you want to be a rocket scientist. This is what you need to do to get there. Right. And of course, there, that eliminates a little bit of creativity in certain aspects. But at the same time, you know that if you have a goal, you can achieve it by doing these things. And I think there's a lot of, uh, again, like I said, there's a lot of nuance in understanding a society that you haven't lived in. So for you and I, like you've been here for, you said 11 years. 11 right? years, yeah. yeah. So for me, I've been here six of the last seven. That experience is something that you and I can understand in ways that's very difficult unless you've been in China. And I think the more people have the experience of traveling to countries like China and you know, kind of seeing the different cities, the different provinces, and how each province, similar to the U.S., each state has its own identity. Each province has its own identity. Absolutely. And people have their own identities as well, even within that structure of homogeneity. So I, I think that's a, it's a really you fascinating know, point. I, I'm sure you've noticed, though, is, is that that doesn't really happen for everybody who comes yeah. here. That is true. I mean, you know, the, the, uh, if, if a foreigner is coming to live in China, you would expect that they're immediately at a disposition to be a little bit more open-minded. Yeah. But you do get a lot of foreigners who have just been here for a long time. <laughs> and they never and break that wall. Still, yeah, they're still just like, nah, nah. Yeah, yeah. And eventually you want to, you know, this is something you can't really say in the West. Uh -huh. But here, it's a fairly, you know, it's it's a newly open society. You yeah. do ask the question, it's like, well, why are you here? Yeah, that is it's true. It's like, you know, there, there's more implications uh, to saying that in a privileged society where mm -hmm. someone is coming from a less privileged country, saying, go yeah. back to where you came from. That's not, not a good thing <laughs> exactly, to say. Exactly. But here... You know, if your country is so much better and you're coming here yeah. to this underprivileged country, you're just complaining. what are you doing here? <laughs> That's really funny because you're 100% right. It's like every once in a while you bump into someone who's just complaining on end about their experience here. And yeah. It's like, wait, so wait, why are you still here? Yeah. Man? yeah. You don't have to actually be here. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, it's interesting. I run into these people yeah. all the time. Yeah. and I just it's Mostly in bars. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's when they start yeah. complaining. I mean, you can understand for the... Um, you know, there are inter international teachers who come through and they spend two or three years here. But you got mm. people who have been here doing yeah. all different kinds of businesses or moving from job to indeed, job indeed. over a 10 year period. And they're still like, ah, yeah, I mean, I know people who move their families out here, man, and they're just they don't want to be here. And I always ask, like, man, are you planning on going back home or yeah. just like, nah, man, I'm here for at least another year. And that year turns into another year. And, yeah. you know, they have no but, intentions but, of leaving. But, but, but some of them are still really negative. Yeah, and, yeah. and the worst thing is, is when, like, for example, if it's a foreigner who marries a Chinese here, mm. it's like they uh you wonder for their kids who are like you know mixed mm. race to begin with like right. what, what, how are they going to grow up Indeed. like how are they going to be um are they going to be proud of their chinese mm. heritage and stuff like that with a father who's talking like this <laughs> yeah. you know about yeah. china but yeah. um the 
the, the funny thing is, is when you hear these people, they, they, when they have a Chinese wife and they have half Chinese kids, it's almost like an excuse to be even more critical of China. Mm-hmm. And it, it's almost like, so it's like, oh, well, I have a Chinese wife right. and, and Chinese is, a, is crap. <laughs> and it's, it's almost like that guy who says, yeah. no, I'm not racist. I have a black friend. Yeah, exactly. It's like, right? but then it's they're the same, saying all, everything they're saying. <laughs> yeah, it's the same context, right? Contradicts <laughs> <laughs> that statement. It's like, do you hear yourself? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It's like, funny. I'm not racist, but right, well, as right. soon as you hear that, but. <laughs> it's like, Okay, well, where are we going with this? Yeah, that's, yeah, that's really yeah, funny. yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but I think it's a, I think it's a testament to uh, exactly what we we're talking about before, like the nuance of foreign countries. It's like there are so many positive things that happen on a day to day basis from being a foreigner living in a foreign country, and even a foreigner living in China as well. And like you've experienced them, I've experienced them, where you just have that random act of kindness, where someone taps you on your shoulder, "Hey, are these your gloves?" Oh, I did yeah. drop my gloves on the yeah. street. Where in New York City, man, I've dropped things and I've lost things and I'm walking around for an hour and didn't realize my hat fell off my head. And of course, there are plenty of people around. When it does happen, it's something spectacular. Because I have to say, to add some balance here, I was in Manhattan once. I was walking and I dropped my wallet and somebody did grab it and they get it to me. It does happen. So it does happen. happen. But But the thing is that to your point, though, people Mm. don't expect it to happen Mm. here and it does. Mm. And the thing that compounds my surprise about foreigners here who are still negative is foreigners are treated really well in China. People treat them really well. Yeah, that is true. When, you know, they, they go out of their way to, to, to make sure that you're, you feel accommodated here. It doesn't matter what political things are going on. It doesn't That's matter that. Right. So right now, you know, the, the tensions between China and, and, and the U.S., I'm, I'm sure, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, nobody's targeting you saying, oh, you're an American and no, we're, no, no. we got problems with you. Yeah, I think uh, that that harkens back to my, my first experience of being a foreigner on my own in Chongqing uh, back in 2013 when I would walk up and down the uh, streets of Zhoujie uh, over in Guanyinchao. Uh, so I used to walk up and down the road uh, to the metro station or just like going to the shopping mall. And this is maybe two or three weeks of being here. And the worst thing that would happen is someone would go, oh, why go ahead? And people would turn around and yeah. say, look, a foreigner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. now, you know, the city is becoming more international. So that doesn't happen at all uh, with the exception of like here and there. Some looks or exactly, something like that. Exactly. Like, oh, but no okay. one's ever like chased me down the street like, oh, there's foreigners. And that's, nothing like that's ever happened, you know. And I yeah. feel as though... Those are the kinds of stories that people don't hear about. But, you know, one of my uh, my old colleagues said this to me when I first arrived in Chongqing. He said, when you start reading blogs about a, a city or a place, remember that the people who are enjoying themselves aren't the ones writing the blogs because those are the people who are enjoying themselves. They're outside. Right. The yeah. Friendships that they're making, the restaurants and the food. And the people who are just sitting inside complaining about what's going on outside are just typing away. So sometimes a, you have to be mindful about that. That's a really good point. Yeah. And that, that's a point that could apply to anywhere. 100%. 100%. It is, yeah. yeah. And I mean, that, that's what got me doing. I, I mean, I started making some content to kind of counter some of the stuff that's yeah. out there. And the thing that drove me was just seeing that, seeing the lack of balance in the conversation out yeah, there. Yeah. But that's, that's an important thing to keep in mind that I didn't um, uh, think about directly is that, yeah, the people who are usually spending their time online are the ones that have nothing better to do. <laughs> Indeed, because there's, you know, every city I've been to in, in China has a different aspect to it that is not comparable to the things I understand uh, by way of living in the United States. Uh, for example, going to a place like Fairy Mountain. I mean, it's one of the most gorgeous natural uh, elements I've ever seen. And it altered the way I viewed the world because it was just such an awe-inspiring moment that I couldn't even take a picture in the first hour I was there. I just even, kept even when you around. do, you can't right, exactly. capture that place. Yeah, and, I've been know, there. I've, I've tried to explain it to people. Like when you're standing at the the middle of this valley, looking up at these massive like mountain ranges, it's it's a sight to behold, you know. And, and it, something like that is uh, an experience. And of course, we have mountain ranges in the United States as well. We have our own elements. You know, we have our own uh, sites that are uh, plentiful. You're, you're, you're talking about New York. You're talking about I mean, Florida. Well, yeah, I'm, you know, you know like I'm, the, I'm, the Rocky I'm, Mountains. Well, yeah, you have that, the Appalachian yeah. Mountains going right, right, towards right. Uh, Pennsylvania and stuff like that. But that, that's the thing. And actually, even after 11 years, um, so I drive between uh, Shenzhen and, and Hong Kong a lot. Yeah. Hong Kong has a lot of beautiful scenery too. Yeah. The bridges and that the mountains. Bridge view, man. Yeah, like. Ten, like in Hong Kong dollars drive across that bridge yeah, I'd do yeah, it every day if I could yeah yeah no it's yeah. just and and <clears throat> the thing that 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 struck me the most was not how beautiful it was mm. but that how after 11 years I still it still doesn't get old yeah, yeah. and and so you know Chongqing's a whole nother level you know so like uh, Hong Kong and, and Shenzhen is like a 3d city for me coming from Ontario mm. I remember the first time I took my wife to um, to Canada and uh, when we we're going from Toronto to Niagara Falls there's a bridge you got to go over on St. Catharines and you go way up and then you can see, you know, as far as your eye can see, and it's just flat. 
and, yeah, and my cool. wife noticed that and she's like wow it's so flat yeah. here Man, i'm like I, yeah I exactly what you but 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 here in chongqing it's like a 4d city mm. and i was talking with uh, ben brown which i who, who i did a, a an episode with also and it's it's interesting because here when you give directions mm. it's not only that way or that way it's got a gradient to it also <laughs> exactly it's like you go that way so it's like yeah yeah 100% <laughs> it's completely man, 4d mountains. even even <laughs> your wild. directions even when you're pointing you got to yeah. take into consideration like go up this way take a left down that hill <laughs> yeah, yeah, turn yeah, around yeah. this staircase it's like wait wait staircase and yeah. then you get to the staircase and it's 150 steps <laughs> but but even even like general like uh, 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 points like yeah. if you know you know you know you're, you're, you're northeast southwest and you can say oh it's about that direction mm. but here people who really know their direction who are good with directions they'll also add the gradient to right. it with their arm yeah, it's, it's a such a fascinating city and yeah. i mean back to the the, uh, the nature points one of the coolest things for me about living in chongqing and being so close to new york city is the, this river you know because uh i feel like i've been to new york city plenty of times over the last 15 20 years and you never get this close to the, I, I personally never get that close to the river but here i've had uh, two riverview apartments and waking up every morning and seeing it doesn't get old to me you yeah know? And it's just something that has kind of, you know, given influenced me to search for different things in life, like the little things that are that make you happy. When you yeah. wake up in the morning and you see a boat going by, and it's like, man, you know what? I would like to find this same thing when I go back to the states, like finding a place where I can live near a river or some body of water, and just kind of take these experiences and like replicate them in ways that kind of, you know, yeah, yeah. Alter and, the, and, and you know what's useful structure. too, though, is I found is. Um, when I've been posting videos and stuff like that and seeing people comment on things, I've seen people pick up on things that I've, I mm. have started to start to take for granted. Yeah. And so one of them was, and I talked to Ben about this, um, is that I, I recorded a video when I was in Hunan on the way here. Yeah. And I, I, I woke up <clears throat> really early. I couldn't sleep. It was like 5 a.m. or something like that. It was still pitch back, black dark outside. And I found a dark alleyway with a few lights. Yeah. And I was recording a video. And it was a video on uh, real estate in China, the property ownership topic. Okay. And one of the things that a few people picked up on, they're like, wow, it's like you're, you're, you're recording this video here. There was a hooded guy walking by you <laughs> and you're not even concerned. Yeah. And, and yeah, this like the safety element here. It is so safe in China. Yeah, yeah. And it was like when, when those comments were made, it reminded me, it's like, oh, yeah, that's a thing, isn't it? Yeah, you don't there, even think there, twice there, about there are neighborhoods it. in yeah. New York. There are neighborhoods in Toronto that you, yeah, you wouldn't, if somebody's, you hear footsteps behind you, you're going to want to make sure you know what's going on. Yeah, man, it's, it's funny you say that because uh, the other day I was in the bank and uh, I actually had my wallet out as I'm putting my cash into my wallet, walking out of the bank. And I'm like thinking to myself, man, I would never do this. <laughs> and it, it, it was like one of those things, exactly what you're saying, you know, and I had to think twice, like, you know, don't build bad habits just because you think it's safe you don't want to yeah, like, right, kind of like, right, you know, right. ruin the basis of how you got to yeah. where you are so it's like but you're, you're 100% right it's like feeling safe here uh, I've never actually felt in danger living here and I think yeah, that's one no. of those things that and, and, and so be, what, uh, what happened after that ideas. comment yeah what happened after that comment also is now every time I walk down a dark alleyway mm -hmm. Or I, I walked up a, a dark star staircase here the other day. I was like, yeah, that's actually, yeah. I've learned to appreciate it. So yeah, it's it kind of... <laughs> it is, man. And I think there's like an, an added level of stress that you feel when you subconsciously are feeling in danger. Whereas when you're here, it's kind of like lifted off your shoulders. Yeah, and you yeah, don't feel yeah. It and it works the other way also. It's like, you know, so you'd have an appreciation because everybody feels safe here. I mean, you see, you see, well, you know, single women walking outside late at night and stuff like that, and they don't feel in danger also. Yep. And so that actually affects us also because, you know, it, it, for example, if you're walking at night down a road or something like that and there's a single female in front of you, you're conscious of <laughs> yeah. how you're going to be viewed. Exactly, exactly. And it's like here, it's okay. You just walk past them and stuff like right. that. They're not going to be, you know, because everybody everybody feels really, really... Yeah, that, that is true. And I think that's a that's an added value of living in a homogenous society where there are so many norms uh, that have kind of built themselves into the culture in ways that, you know, once you live here, you kind of let that same kind of style build into your lifestyle. And I think it's cool, you know? Like for me, the other day I hopped on an elevator and there was a woman with her tiny puppy. And again, like you said, if I were in New York, I'm really conscious about how people perceive me yeah. because as a black Wait man- Wait for the next elevator or right, something like you that. Know, people start clutching things sometimes and that's their own personal life choice but you know at the same time I'm conscious of that sort of thing and the woman just like said oh hey and just like stood aside and I hit the button and I'm thinking to myself about exactly what we're talking about you know I, I, that, yeah I, I feel that, like I feel like this is a topic that China really appreciates and is on yeah. top of mm. because you know what um so, uh, you know, th and this ties into censorship. So censorship uh, also ties into this idea of harmony here. Mm. And so obviously there are pros and there, there are good things and there are negative things you can say about censorship. Right. But as far as I can see from how they're applying it, they're applying it fairly equally. So those kind of, uh, um, uh, you know, they had some uh, issues with terrorism and things like that in China. Yeah. 
and they censored a lot of those attacks. Um, and to and the benefit of that, in my opinion, is that you don't start dividing society where people say, oh, there's this specific ethnic group that is at a higher propensity to, uh, you know, mm. um, uh, engage in terrorist attacks against Han Chinese or whatever yeah, it is right. and create these divides. Because if you look at what happened in ni- at ni- after 9-11, yeah. anybody who was brown was implicated. Right. I mean, yeah, there, were, exactly. there were people who were Sikh who were, who were killed exactly. because yeah. uh, they thought they were Muslim and, and they needed to pay for the crimes for what happened in yeah, 9-11. Yeah, a lot of and so, that, and that affected me also because <laughs> I remember... I, I wanted to, there was a small airport in uh, Ontario and I wanted to do flight lessons yeah. <laughs> with my friend. Yeah. And you can imagine how self-conscious I felt after I 9-11. Yeah, I'm I, like, I, am I still allowed to do flight right, lessons? Right, right, like, right. Is, this, is this okay? Yeah, it's like you put on a list and you never know about yeah. it. Yeah, like yeah, yeah, later yeah, when that's you're trying right. to travel with your family and it's like, sir, could you step aside? That's right. And it's like, what's going on here? Yeah, it's and like you just, went for flight lessons yeah, no, and now we're concerned about you. Yeah, exactly. And that's the other interesting thing too is because, mm-hmm. you know, obviously there's a lot of uh, misconceptions around the social credit system and stuff like that and how it really works but we have that overseas also it's right, just right, not right. transparent indeed, indeed it's like you know uh, you go onto these lists the no fly list if you're on that you find out when you're at the airport yeah, exactly and, and 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 it was when it was initially um suggested they even went as far as wanting to tie in this your actual credit score <laughs> your your financial yeah. credit score into the system mm-hmm. and um this is an example at lunch i told you about my friend who went to the u.s and she she came back to canada and the canadian border patrol said do you have anything to declare and she said no and she was in the u.s for less than 24 hours so she doesn't have an, an allowable limit of alcohol she's able to bring back after they pop the trunk they see a bottle of wine in the trunk and they just start yelling at her like really yelling in her face <laughs> with spit flying in her face yeah and then um, I, I I don't think she was actually penalized for it. There wasn't a fine or anything like that. I think she had to uh, give she had to leave the bottle of wine. Mm. But almost every single time after that, she was stopped at the border when she was coming back, and yeah. she had to get out for additional inspection. Mm. And she obviously knows what the reason is. It's because of that. But there's no way you can look it up. There's right, no right. transparency of it. I, I get what you there's mean. no um, there's no way that they tell you how can you rectify this. But with the social credit system. The, 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 the details about how it works and the mechanics yeah. and how you get off of a blacklist, for example, are all really, really transparent. Yeah. And, but it's like, if you want to do something like this, the only way to do it is quietly, yeah. without telling anybody. Mm. Because everybody else who's judging China for having something like this, they already have it. Right, right. I, th- I think there's an interesting, uh, you know, for me, I'm a tech guy. So for me, right, I'm this always time, focusing yeah. on technology and how it, it uh, interacts with security. Uh, one of my first uh, uh, big reports that I put together when I started teaching at the university here was uh, called The Future of Technology and Governance, and it examined uh, how governments utilize technologies and how the citizens can counteract some of the, the negative aspects of that and how the two can work in harmony utilizing technology. As it relates to censorship, I think it's quite fascinating because uh, you start to see fragmentations in the internet. And like, currently that's happening in Iran where uh, the government has their own, essentially their own firewall to what can be accessed from within the state and what uh, the people can see. So I, I do agree with you on that point that there are ways to utilize censorship in ways that are positive to prevent people from being marginalized. And it's just that the, the, the outside populations have to be willing to under, to do the right amount of research to figure out what it is that people are being censored from and what they have access to. Uh, one of the interesting points about censorship, when as far as it goes to Facebook, Google, and Instagram, uh, this is really fascinating to me because um, uh, I remember watching an article, an interview with an NBA player who was playing basketball in China during one of the off seasons, or while he was in the midst of a contractual negotiation with an NBA team, he was playing in China, and he's like, "Man, they don't have access to Instagram. How can you live like that?" And it's funny because uh, I think about that sort of thing all the time. Like when I first got here, I was like, man, how can you survive without Facebook? But Mm -hmm. what you begin to realize is that when there is no Google or Facebook or Instagram, people start to realize that they need to build their own. So then you see the emergence of WeChat technology and it becoming ubiquitous across the society because there is no uh, giant other business doing this better than anybody else. There's just no company available to provide that service we need to create it and that's why the the alibaba's the tencent uh apparatus comes about so i think there's a fascinating discussion to have that and uh i'm really always interested in seeing how technology basically bridges this gap where you start to see how the citizens are being 
uh, thwarted in some ways by censorship, but they're also able to interact with each other to have discussions about it on the internet or in personal forums. And I, and I always wonder what the future of that looks like once China becomes more of a, a bigger player in the, in the global market. That really does create um, a lot of opportunity for China, doesn't it, yeah. by censoring. For me, I, I, and maybe I have a more optimistic view, but I think that's a side benefit yeah. uh, for what the main purpose of censorship is. Right, right, right. Um, you know, because it, it, there was an opportunity with Facebook um, uh, back when and there were some uh, terrorist events in Xinjiang and everything mm. like that. Yeah, I think I saw they, some of those. Yeah, on they, 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 re they reached out to Facebook to say, mm. hey, listen, there are some of these groups who are killing people who are organizing in these groups on mm. Facebook. Can you shut them down? Right. And they said, no, nah, it doesn't work like that here. We can't do that. And yeah. they're like, okay, well, we'll block the whole thing. Yeah, yeah. And so I think... I think there was a national security element um, involved in that, especially with, you know, if, if there were people who wanted to infiltrate China, that would be the best way to do it through social media yeah, and all indeed, this stuff. Indeed. I mean, we, we our minds overseas are controlled yeah. by social media. Yeah, people the, use it every day. Just the implications the of allowing uh, foreign platforms to do the same thing here mm. are pretty great during this. Yeah, for you know, sure, for sure. I could only yeah. imagine like, yeah. you know, a company like Instagram being infiltrated and like utilizing that to, yeah, like, yeah. you know, take over the youth's but minds the, for an entire yeah. day by just utilizing some of these algorithms that are just so oh, yeah. effective. Well, well and, they were talking about the, the yeah. what is it, the Britannica, or not Britannica, uh, I'm, I'm messing up the name now, for, for Trump's campaign. The, uh, oh, Cambridge the, Analytica. Ca Cambridge Analytica, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, the algorithms, man, it's, it's pretty wild stuff. Like, you know, you're scrolling over something for more than a second, it just basically tags that sort of content and it presents more of what you like to the point of you're just constantly. Oh yeah, up. yeah, and that's what creates those yeah. divides, and, and to the point where yeah. you you know in a in a in a developed country, you yeah. know, and like in Portland, you have you know Antifa physically fighting red hat wearing <laughs> Trump supporters, yeah, yeah, and it's, it's like wild stuff. You, can you imagine if that happened yeah. with a billion plus population, you're yeah. having a divide like that yeah, be, during this important period of development? It would be really messy. But so back to my original point, yeah. So that creates an interesting opportunity for local companies mm. and where they can um, grow and 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 build their kind of put their foothold here, and then you and you have uh, products like TikTok that then yeah, yeah, then yeah. can grow exactly. internationally. But on the flip side, what you have is obviously people are perceiving that as a kind of uh, economic protectionism, I guess. Mm. And then you have these kind of campaigns to do the same thing in the opposite direction. For example, with Huawei, okay, what, what, right, what right, I think right. is, you know, because Microsoft spoke out about that too. They said, mm. they said, this is unconstitutional. Can you tell us why we're not allowed to do business with yeah. Huawei? And the answer from the current administration was just trust us. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. it's like, if you saw what we saw and it's like, well, that's not how it's supposed to work in our society. Right. Right. And, and, and so uh, that's the scary thing about how far is this going to go? Mm. where people are creating this kind of... So it starts with an economic war, mm. and it reminds me of a, a talk. I can't remember the name off of the, the, the top of my head, where when you get into these situations, particularly when you have a, a rising power that's going to overtake the existing power, 80% mm. of the time it ends in war. And that's my concern yeah, right now. Is the, the Francis Fukuyama... The, oh, there are a lot of different... Uh, you know, philosophies on this kind of transition. Yeah. Of power. yeah. So for me, that's my biggest concern right now mm. is you see what's happening and it's pretty, um, it, it, it's pretty vindictive. It's getting pretty nasty. Right. Um, and that, that's, yeah, that's, I, uh, I, I throw you my theory on this. So I, I think it's, uh, again, I think we're in the midst of a, uh, a historical moment, uh, that's going to alter the way things happen for the next 40, 50 years. And there are a lot of different um, elements that are happening between countries uh, and within the global markets that are reminiscent of the pre-World War II. Uh, there's a book that I, I've read called The Revolt of the Elite by Christopher Lash. And in the book, he talks about democracy and how our interactions are evolving and how we should essentially find new ways to solve problems as it relates to the American democracy, the American democratic system, uh, how to solve the two-party problem as well. And that book is the uh, essentially the, uh, the the successor to the Revolt of the Masses by Jose Ortega y Gasset, and that book was written in 1921, I want to say. Mm -hmm. And the book is so fascinating because he literally is like detailing all of these think these all of these moments that are occurring within society in Europe. Uh, like post-industrial Europe, people are there are a lot of poor people who are just kind of getting by and building up their uh, their family assets trying to figure out how to survive and you know the war is coming but nobody knows this at the time he's publishing this book and it's such a fascinating critique of society from his perspective that how are we going to solve these problems i keep seeing all these things mounting and mounting and mounting and then a war occurs and it changes everything uh, the moment we're in now i feel as though it's not going to be 
as destructive. I think we're right now currently in a bunch of little wars. Uh, we're in a bunch of cyber wars. Uh, right. When I say us, I mean the U.S. is in a bunch of cyber wars with Russia and with the Chinese and with the and, North and, Koreans. And then economic wars. Yeah, and, and then the economic wars. And all of these things are proxies that I think have uh, essentially prov- I would like to say they're preventing us from getting to an actual hot war, a physical uh, confrontation. Because I feel as though the uh, war now is almost uh, it's almost similar to the Cold War era where nuclear weapons are not going to be used. We've done that before and we've seen what's happened. Now everyone should be afraid that we're going to use them again. And that leads to the, a resolution in whatever form that resolution looks like. We'll, we'll get there. But I feel as though that's what war is now. That's what the big war is. And of course, there are current wars in uh, Afghanistan that are still going on. And you have these conflicts in places like Syria. Uh, so it's not the, not, that's not to say that war is obsolete by any means. Uh, but what I believe is that uh, the United States is the, the, the power dynamics of its economic strength is slowly diminishing in ways that it will leave the UK in a situation where it's going to find more value in partnering with countries like China and uh, sort of leaving the United States and Europe to build a new coalition that will lead to a more multipolar world. Uh, I'm not certain yet that uh, China has built up the norms that the rest of the global uh, society is willing to accept as uh, an individual hegemon to rule the the global uh, uh, marketplace, so to speak. Uh, But I do believe that they have the economic prowess and a a lot of the, the, I, I guess, enough of the middle class to be able to say, okay, we have these elements that should allow us to push forward some of these norms that we've been uh, developing. So let's take as much as we can get. And I think by taking as much as they can get, keeping in mind that this is not a short term uh, design, this is a hundred year process that the Chinese are looking forward to building a society that is long term sustainable. And I think with that in mind, there's more value in them saying, okay, we're willing to function within this multipolar structure. And I think it'll We'll see how we get there, but I feel like that's the more more likely than so, an actual war. Okay, so you're a bit more optimistic that it <laughs> won't necessarily. Yeah. yeah, I mean, maybe it's to the point where we have enough artificial intelligence that even yeah. before you go to war, you can calculate based on how much equipment you have, who's going to win. Yeah. It's interesting because I listened to a podcast with my kids. Uh, mm. I think it's, uh, there's a couple. There's one called Pickle. And then there's another one called uh, Short and Curly. They're mm. philosophy podcasts for kids. <laughs> and they talk about cool. yeah, they talk about whether wars should be fought with robots in the future that mm. are programmed not to be able to kill humans <laughs> and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah. And they go into this thing. And my son, who's in the back there, he, he said... Um, he, he said, well, then, yeah, if that happens, then you just send humans in. I'm like, well, no, because then the robots can meet them. He said, no, 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 they're programmed not to kill humans. Right. So you can do this. You know. <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> but, but what I thought, and they didn't mention the issue of like, well, if it gets down to that point, it mm. just comes down to well, whoever has, uh, you know, you, mm. can, you can make a calculation on who's going to win. Right. Then you don't need to go to war to begin with. Indeed. You just plug it into the computer and you say, okay, I win mm. the war. Yeah. So it's almost like maybe we got to that point where it's like, okay, war is going to be pointless. It's probably going to end like this. We have enough, you know, prediction software and all these things that can figure this out. Mm. But um, it's, uh, I'm glad to hear from your point of view, yeah, a little man, bit more I, optimistic I about... It, you know, even looking at the, uh, the 2016 U.S. election and the, let's say, the two and a half years following that, people are talking about the Russian interference in the election and how that influenced the, the outcome of the, you know, the presidential, the right. current presidential administration. And the interesting thing for me is that uh, in 2012 and 2013, I was doing some research and I stumbled upon this uh, uh, this influence campaign that the Finnish online, uh, there was a policy they were pushing that was being negatively influenced by Russian bots. And I remember talking to people about it. Everyone's like, man, yeah, that's pointless. And then you go on to look at uh, how things have evolved in that time period. And it's almost like it was a test campaign to basically drive division between the two political parties in the U.S. And I think it's quite fascinating to see that because I feel as though that is a new form of warfare in ways yeah. that, you know, perhaps uh, we're looking at the evolution of how conflicts are, are are basically developed, but we don't know how they're going to end. And that's why it's still possible that a hot war is, is feasible, and I hope not. But what I'm, what I'm beginning to believe about humanity as I get a little bit older is that uh, there are generally more ways to find uh, resolutions to conflicts when there's more at stake. And right now the world currently has, uh, is, is globally intertwined in ways that you can't attack another country without negatively influencing your own. There are so many expatriates spread out across nations now that to attack one country would essentially uh, put your own people in danger in ways that I feel as though countries aren't willing to make those type of sacrifices. R- right, longer. but to tie into that question about what is at stake, 
so for the U.S., I mean, so much of their identity is based on we're number one and yeah. we're we're the global kind of you right. know authority, and so that's what's at stake is yeah. that it looks yeah. like China might overtake them, and so if they decide that that's an important enough issue that's at stake, I, I, for me, that's what I feel like would be the the thing that pushes it over the edge. Yeah, I could see that, and, and I think uh, further to that point, I think that's part of the reason why you're starting to see the current administration make moves that it's doing towards China, and I think it's. Uh, uh, I, I guess to to say it like this, that idea, uh, that concept of this uh, unencumbered uh, number one country in the world, the uh, leader of the free world, all of these different idioms that we utilize to describe the country, a lot of those things are being punctured. And I think that in itself already has threatened the concept of the global hegemon ruling the world. And again, I believe that 40, 50 years from now, when people look back in this time period, they're not going to say, oh, this happened in 2021 or 20." 22 or 2025 they'll say if you look back at the american democracy it started crumbling maybe 10 years ago and in 2012 to 2016 you start seeing certain aspects of it that perhaps could have been strengthened and because they weren't those things are what led to the 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 crumbling of the american hegemony and i think again like i said i don't think that the american system is going to collapse by any means but I, what i do believe is that uh, the U.S. is going to have to find ways to work inside of a multipolar system that is more um, apt to say, okay, we need to work with the European Union to figure out how to bolster democracy. And by doing so, they'll have to find ways that capitalism may fall to the wayside and more socialist policies will come into play. Uh, and maybe perhaps you'll see something like uh, the American, the North American Union, where the U.S., Canada, and Mexico find their way together to, you know, essentially d design uh, the future of what democracies look like. Yeah, I mean, well, that's something under the current administration we're moving away from, right, with NAFTA right, right, right. being uh, taken apart. Yeah, and that's like the ebbs and flows of history, where you start to see things that prior didn't look feasible, but the solutions that we have to find to fix these problems, I feel like... You know, there's some possible, and again, I'm optimistic about the future, so right. I'm, maybe I'm <laughs> maybe I'm a little too optimistic about that. But I feel as though these are the kinds of policies and these are the kinds of shifts that are going to uh, be the resolutions to these new problems that we're encountering. Because uh, the the digital threats that we're encountering these days, uh, the Iranian uh, uh, IRGC, the way that they're developing their capability, their their online capabilities. Uh, the same with the North Koreans, the Chinese, and the Russians. It, it's like you can't underplay the the threat of how the online war is going to be waged. And I think that it's something that uh, less people are informed about than should be. And I feel as though the, the longer this plays out, the more unaware the general population is, the more dangerous it becomes. Because people are unaware that, for example, uh, clicking on a random link in an email will give you a virus. Right. right. <laughs> and it's like things like that uh, are make it very easy for people to become susceptible to online frauds and to click on malwares that infect their device. And it's one thing to have one device connected, but by infecting one device, I could potentially infect an entire network and every computer that connects to that and that could change the entire dynamic of a small city or a small town. I mean, everything. It implicates yeah, yeah. everything, right? Power systems, satellite systems. Exactly. I mean, exactly. everything. That is the way to do it. And then, I mean, right now, it, it seems like it's playing out more with uh, propaganda. That's yeah, the indeed, way it's done. Indeed. I mean, I don't know if you saw the story of, uh, I don't know if I'm pronouncing the name of this news outlet, right? The, the Epoch Times or something like that? Yeah, yeah I know what you're Yeah, about. they were yeah. taken offline because, and they were using AI, artificially generated faces yeah, to yeah, add yeah. authenticity. It's wild stuff, man. It like is. The, the deep fakes is what they call them. Yeah, they that's right. Fakes. Did uh, you I've see that it. one with Obama where he's yeah. talking? Yeah. And that's <laughs> something, eh? Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's different, man. And I, and I believe that we're at the, the, the cusp of it. And what you'll start seeing is that these technologies are just a precursor to something far more complex that people are not ready for. And once they get out into the open space, it's almost impossible to put those back into the Pandora's box, so to speak. And I think that uh, we're not having those conversations in public. We're not having those conversations uh, in the public discourse or uh, in the current administration. We're talking about one guy instead of talking about the things that affect all of us. And I hope right. that in the future that uh, something that can be addressed. But it seems as though right now uh, you're seeing uh, leaders like uh, Francis Macron uh, and Angela Merkel uh, pushing forward agendas that are more apt to change the way democracies are, are functioning, uh, that change the way that people perceive what it's like to have a, a, a retirement package that is going to help you sustain until old age and, and be able to take care of your children and these sorts of things. And as it relates to technologies, again, back to my favorite topic, uh, unemployment. What are we going to do about this stuff? And because we're not having these conversations, you know, I think we're entering a, a phase where one day we'll have to make these hard decisions about what we're going to do. 
and technology is at the root of every single one of these problems. Right, yeah. And, and so it's by studying economics here mm-hmm. and taking all of these things into consideration that you've just said, what is your opinion in terms of how, ha- how China's handling these issues? Are, 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 is China mm-hmm. facing a lot of these same you know, issues on the same scale that the U.S. is? Or, That's an interesting question. Yeah. yeah are, how, how do you feel like they're doing here in terms of that? Well, I always uh, consider it like this because I, I never like to compare uh, the United States and China. Uh, what I would like to say is this. Uh, because we have public discourse in the United States, our public discourse generates uh, a different polling that allows politicians to lean one way or the other and sometimes to not lean at all. <laughs> uh, and because of that, it, it slows down progress in ways, but as they say, the arc of history trends upward. So we like to hope that things will eventually get done. Uh, whereas here, uh, generally, the public uh, follows the, the intuition of the government. And that can go both ways. If the government decided that they were going to create a bunch of coal-powered plants and replace their entire environmental strategy with coal instead of uh, solar panels and, uh, and wind, then we'd probably have uh, a different discussion right now. But what they're doing is they're saying we need to get rid of these combustible vehicles and replace them with uh, electric vehicles and find new ways to develop autonomous vehicles. So I think what they're doing is they're leaning in the right direction. And you can only hope that that continues to go that way. And I, I believe that that's what they're going to do, is they're going to keep leaning in the direction of saying, what is the greater good for our society and for our, represent, our representation on the, in the global space if we keep developing these robotics? Because right now, China is the number one adopter of robotics. Uh, their manufacturing uh, uh, count for robotics is double the US and Japan right now. So what you're seeing is that they're just pushing forward with uh, advancing and adopting technologies in ways that the rest of the world is going to have to catch up with soon. Otherwise, we're just going to keep falling further behind. Yeah, so I think and, it's going in the right direction. Yeah, and, and, that, and that, that raises an interesting um, a thought that what I think what overseas uh, countries are focusing uh, so much on right now is what could China potentially eventually do with this centralized power and this ability to just move forward with right. whatever they want? And there's not enough discussion about what are they actually doing with it now. Yeah, yeah. And the answer is what they're doing it with it actually now is yeah. quite positive mm. in terms of this in, in environmental issues and all of these things. Sometimes there are, there are certain things that, that, that need a little bit of time for them to catch up on. But overall, that's a really important question or an important consideration that people who criticize China and say, where could this eventually go? are not stopping to, to consider yeah, for a you're, moment. You're, you're right. And I think that's something that uh, perhaps is far more complex than is uh, something you find on the cover of the China Daily News or even the New York Times. It's something that we're literally just going to have to wait and see and hope that it goes in the right direction because from my perspective of six of the last seven years of what I've witnessed here is that there are decisions being made about what does the long-term sustainability of our decisions look like. And there's no four-year election cycles here, so the decisions made are long-term decisions. And I think you know, again, you can't compare the U.S. to China in regards to how the society functions because they have their own cultural norms and their own societal norms, and those things influence how the government functions and the reception of those policies by the people. So when the government says we're aiming towards uh, more utilizing more environmental technologies like wind and solar, the people generally don't blink twice. They're just waiting to see what it looks like. And, and that's kind of what my, my feeling is that uh, when these big, tough uh, things start to come about when these big questions need to be answered the people aren't really thinking too much about what's going to happen because they have trust in their government yeah it's just way. taken care of for yeah. them right right i think yeah i, th- I think that's uh, one of the key points too and and that's, that's some people um fail to even be able to begin to imagine that actually yeah. with the system here where a lot of the leaders are not directly elected there's actually even more accountability right. that they need to say that yes, we're not directly elected, but we, we're doing, we're, we're pushing our society forward and doing yeah, what's right for the that people. Is, that is true too. Whereas, yeah. whereas you know, in, in other countries, it's like you have these uh, politicians in Canada also who come in. They're funded by specific uh, groups, mm. and they've got a, a four-year or an eight-year period to right. capitalize on whatever opportunities yeah, they can yeah. make for themselves. Now, that's a, perhaps a pessimistic view. I'm sure there are people who go into office who want <laughs> to make sure, a difference for, sure, for the country. For sure. But there's more of a risk for it in that kind of a situation mm-hmm. because they can wipe their hands of it after four years. Right, right, right. And, and you're 100% right. And I, I think uh, that kind of plays into the nuance and the complexity of like Western democracies in the, the U.S. and in Canada. But whereas you, you hear there is n- very little nuance when it comes down to what the government policies and the structure it looks like. 
I've been to about 20 or so villages um, in Chongqing, Sichuan, uh, and all around like the eastern side of China. And one of the fascinating things you see is that uh, the village elders generally tend to know what's going on in their city, um, and the people are always informed about what the policies are. And that doesn't make it right or wrong from my perspective. I'm just a witness to what's going on there. So for me, seeing how that society functions, even in the villages where the people are connected to what the government is doing, it, it just kind of shows you that uh, this is not, again, it's not a comparable thing to the Western democracy structure. But I think in a lot of ways, what would be more, I want to say, helpful is that if they were able to figure out ways to explain what it is they're doing to the broader public and the outside world, and maybe it'll help their case in building their momentum for this, uh, their their rise to global uh, yeah. multipolarism. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think uh, that thing that you mentioned about the village elders and there being this kind of a feedback system of people who really know what's going on on right. the ground. And because they're party members as well. Yeah, right. yeah, that's the that's the real difference here. I mean, there's also websites in China. There's yeah. the uh, CPLL, I can't remember what the website is called, but it's, hmm. um, I, I'm sure I got it wrong, but where people can log on and they can post their problems they have with the government as public for yeah. everybody to see. And the response from the government is public also. They are interested in, 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 in keeping the people happy. So that's um, that's perhaps something that a lot of people um, uh, kind of uh, fail to recognize overseas, yeah. that there is this yeah mm. system. And I think probably the biggest threat to that system and the biggest threat to China um, was really corruption. Mm. That's where things can really fall apart, where yeah. you have bad actors in the system yeah, that, that, that destroy it. And I think that's why... With, the, with, with, with Xi currently, he's doing the most important thing to, to, to make this the most important task right. of his rule. And uh, you see it on the ground. Yeah, I mean, you can yeah. see how much it's changed. I'm sure you here also. Oh, yeah. I've and, definitely and, seen and it. For me, from change, running for a bar, sure. from hearing friends, how different the level of service is when they go back to their hometown. And then from yeah. you know, one of your favorite topics, uh, automation and technology and economics, right. Right. everything's becoming uh, automated. Yeah. You know, if you have a factory and you uh, you, you register what your uh, paisui, the um, sewage uh, output. I have so many words now. I, I, I used to more in Chinese. I'm sure learning economics also. Yeah, 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 you man. probably have a lot of words you learn in Chinese and you got, what's the English word for that? It's stuck in my brain right now. And, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but um, they install these systems which will basically, um, they, they, they'll they automatically monitor what you're piping out into the sewage system. And if you right. go over or you have violations, it's immediately goes into the centralized system and there's no one person that you can pay a red envelope right, to to right, get right. rid of that. Yeah, the parking key. tickets, they're immediate. They go into the system. Actually, there was an interesting story where I, um, so I parked on one street uh, and it looked like I was able to park there, but there was uh, some Chinese that said during certain times you can't park there. And, mm -hmm. and I can only speak Chinese. I can't, I can't read <laughs> Chinese. And I got a ticket. I came mm -hmm. out. It was like literally just two minutes. I ran into yeah, the yeah. Photoshop to pick up my passport photos. Mm. And then I came out, and he had already finished putting it in the system. And I said, oh, come on. I say, he said, aren't you supposed to be able to park here for free for 15 minutes? <laughs> he said, no, 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 no. And I started arguing with him. I said, okay, listen. I said, when I, when I, st when I uh, did my li uh, driver's license test in China, mm. I was able to do the test in English. Mm. So that means you already welcome people who can't read Chinese to right, drive right, here. Right. And these signs are only in Chinese. So how was I supposed to know? And he's like, you know what? It's a really great argument, but I can't do anything about it because it's already in the system. Right, right, right. But what I learned after was then the same evening, or it was same evening or the next day, I was parking in front of my bar. Mm. And that time I knew I was over the time, but I was like unloading stuff off of my car. And mm. the same guy gave me a ticket. He didn't realize it was the same car. And I came out and I looked at him and I said, really and he said oh my god he said okay all right listen he said we have uh two or three tickets per month we're allowed to apply for to to to, to basically delete out of the uh. system i'll use one of my allowances yeah <laughs> so so it's, it's interesting they create the system yeah but i think it, i think it's important to have a little bit of flexibility right, right, built right, in because sure, you don't want to sure. make you don't want to make people too upset and, right and that's how things evolve too right yeah. history yeah it's like like you were saying earlier uh today it's like you know we didn't just wake up one day and had stop signs you know it's just like it's a process of yeah. developing societal norms that yeah, yeah. prevent corruption and kind of build how we should all interact together as one. In a yeah, what was interesting about that for me, because my concern was when everything is becoming more strict and more controlled here, is there is a certain quality of life uh, that you can have from having a little bit of built-in flexibility. Right, right, right. And, and so that, that it, realizing that he had two or three tickets he could remove per month, mm. emphasized that, okay, they, they, they recognize that and they yeah. accept that. And I hope they continue to think about that, the little things that don't matter. Yeah. You know, in, 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 in Canada, I'm sure it's the same in the U.S., 
they just find ways to get you. <laughs> it's like, you know, if, if you've got a you've got a 60 zone and it reduces to 40 the speed limit, you've got a cop waiting right at the bottom of that road to get you. Yeah. And they don't, want, they don't want to mess with people like that yeah. here. They don't want to do, you know, if you want to walk around with a beer outside also, mm. it's like, what's the big deal? Yeah, you know, yeah. it's like in so many ways. I remember thinking about that. I was walking, I was drinking a beer, and I was watching some kids skateboarding in front of the mall. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, all of these things would be cracked down on in yeah, the West. It's yeah, like, yeah. Who, who is really free here? <laughs> <laughs> it's really funny because like there are like 20 or 30 examples I'm thinking of right now for yeah. like being in different cities across Europe where it's like, I know exactly what you're talking about. If, for example, <laughs> being in Dublin of all places and like a police officer slapped a beer out of my friend's hand because you can't drink in public yeah. there. It makes sense. But, you know, it's like one of those things where us three foreigners, uh, our Americans, were walking around Ireland. The police officer said, hey, you can't drink in public. And he's like, but it's Dublin. And then she just slapped a can out of his hand and said, you can't do that. And it's yeah, like, yeah. you know, of course, there are reasons why there are these rules are in place. And perhaps, again, 10, 20 years from now, after history starts to kick in, they'll maybe they'll, they'll alter and evolve those laws, too. But the thing that came to mind for me was when you're talking about corruption with the taxis. I don't remember your first experience in Chongqing with the taxis, but I, I tell you, from the first year I was here, probably up until 2017 or so, I, I can tell you the shift is monumental. You, you get into a taxi and the guys are like, oh, where are you going? You tell him, he's like, oh, okay, that'll be 50. Or they'll try to take you on a tour around the city if you don't know Chinese right. well enough, or if you don't know the city well enough, and you don't know the bridges and the back roads. And after a certain period of time, uh, one of my local friends said to me, he's like, you know, if you feel like the taxi driver took you on a ride, just give me the... Uh, the receipt and i'll call them and they'll take the gps in the cars they put gps in all the cars and i'm like what and he's like yeah they did that to prevent taxi drivers from taking advantage of the locals and also foreigners and then the implementation of the dd kwaicha the, yeah. the chinese uber system right and it's like it, it shifted the momentum from the driver to the passenger in ways that you know if you feel as though you're all constantly being cheated by taxis or if you constantly feel as though you know you're not safe in these cars you can take a dd where the security features are increasing monthly as to how they pol how they police their own system you know and it's really fascinating stuff really yeah fascinating. and and it's interesting that it, i mean it's so important for the government to roll out things this quickly yeah. i mean in western societies when you had a developing society there wasn't as much technology involved hmm. and you had the benefit of being able to move slowly with everything because right, everything right, 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 does right, move right. slowly yeah. you don't have that benefit here things yeah. are moving quickly and yeah, and, yeah. and you need to stay on top of this and things stuff. are changing like monthly you know? yeah. and i think it's really fascinating but uh, it's funny also the thing i was going to mention is like uh, when you're saying the Chinese words get stuck in your head. So with economics, the, the there's one character I kept seeing over and over and over again on the PowerPoint slides. And I'm just like, man, I need to get this character. And I'd always miss it. I always miss it. And by maybe the fourth week, I altered my system of how I was writing my notes in my book. So on the left-hand side, I started writing down the characters. And then later on that day, I'd go back and translate them and then figure out the pinyin so I know how to say them and this sort of thing. And the one word, every time someone says, oh, so you take your classes in Chinese, like, what have you learned? The first thing that comes to my mind is uh, na shi jun hang mo xing. <laughs> so it means the Nash equilibrium model. And it's like stuck in my head. Like I can see those characters. Like it's, it's, it's unreal, man. Because it took me so long to say, okay, I've seen this character enough that I can write it down. Right, now it's it. burned in yeah, your mind. Exactly, man. And I feel like that was part of the, the transition from learning, okay, if I'm going to, if I'm going to make it through this program, I'm going to have to learn enough Chinese to be sustainable, man. So, you know, just buckle down and you're going to learn more Chinese while you're learning economics. So it was pretty fascinating. Yeah, that's I mean, it's yeah, you're pretty much you're learning Chinese and economics at the same time. Yeah, yeah, and was, that's was, that's it something. Was, it was definitely was. Yeah. Yeah. So then after you're done this, after you're done your uh, economics uh, PhD, what, what, what do you think is next? Well, um, that's a tough question for me because uh, currently I feel as though I'm still leaning towards being an academic and teaching or um, maybe doing a master's in statistics is something that I've really been thinking about as like my the last frontier. Like I've been obsessed with statistics for quite some time and I feel as though uh, after I finish my degree here, I'd either want to go back to Europe, uh, perhaps France, <clears throat> pardon me, or somewhere like Korea or Japan. And I'm thinking that if I can find a way to integrate my uh, my desire to do this master's in statistics with some type of work for a large Fortune 500 company or an emerging startup somewhere in one of those countries, then perhaps I'll do that. Otherwise, I'll probably head back to New York and uh, maybe relax for a couple of weeks, a couple of months, and kind of like you know, trying to build up my momentum towards something uh, more exciting. I mean, the, the obvious thing that comes to mind to me is that uh, whatever you do with a Fortune 500 company or yeah. anything, 
your China connection is going to be really important for you. Right, right. And if that company is doing anything in any meaningful way with China, yeah. I think that makes you a pretty uh, attractive candidate in terms of that. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Because like my one of my interests has been in venture capital for quite some time, and I don't want to overstate that uh, because it's just something I've been uh, kind of uh, fascinated with, like understanding how you can develop not just companies but people and. That philosophy has been stuck with me. I, I've read a bunch of works by George Dorio, uh, the guy who created the first uh, venture capital firm in the United States. Um, and, and it's really fascinating stuff, like looking at his, at his papers. He was a professor at Harvard, a uh, French national. And I, I've been listening to the podcast, the Bootstrap VC cap, uh, podcast by Arlen Hamilton. Okay. And it's, it's really cool. So like listening to or reading these old historical texts about venture capital and then listening to someone who started their own venture capital firm with uh, different intentions for purpose of like rebuilding communities and b developing people. So like, that's something I'm really interested in, but I don't want to put myself in a position where I'm just kind of like pigeonholed down this road uh, if that's not where I want to go. So I, but that is one something I'm, something I'm quite interested in. Right, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, statistics also, I mean, um, that, that, I mean, that's something that really helps you in every aspect oh, of yeah, life, for sure, really. For sure, for sure. I mean, that's... Uh, I was listening to a podcast today where they mentioned that, you know, if there was one mandatory course for all kids to learn at mm. some point, it's statistics. Yeah, it helps yeah. you in so many aspects in, of indeed, life. Indeed, indeed. And, you know, probable I, outcomes and all this kind of stuff. Exactly. And I, and I think that one of the uh, most important things for me as a student is making sure, like, the kids that I influence, telling them, like, you know, when I was younger, I was obsessed with foreign languages. Uh, and that was, like, kind of what drove me to living abroad, living in Paris, then Brussels, and England, Germany, and now here, of course, and one of the cool things about that was uh, discovering my own mind in a way. So I realized, like, I'm, uh, I, I always thought that I, would, I leaned more right brain than left brain. I've always believed that. Okay. And uh, since, I want to say, ninth grade in high school, I've always been able to, like, activate my left brain without thinking about it. Just like, oh, math. I love <laughs> math problems. And as I get older, I'm starting to realize that if I don't constantly activate my left brain, then I'm kind of trapped in my creative space. Right. So now I'm able to, uh, because I'm conscious of that, I'm able to kind of manipulate the two in ways that allow me to not just be creative, uh, but also to be rigid in my creativity and say, okay, if you're going to attack this problem, you need to make sure that what you're focusing on isn't just futuristic science fiction. You know, It's like if you want to solve the problem of unemployment, for example, it's like, don't look at just unemployment numbers. Don't just look at like, oh, well, if I were a plumber doing X, Y, and Z, I could do this. It's like, no, look at a specific problem and figure out how to solve that utilizing the best of both abilities that you have. So I think that's kind of like my, my passion with this whole right. thing. And statistics, man, it's, if you, I think with the statistics degree, you can probably find work anywhere. So I yeah, always exactly. like to preach that. Yeah, no, yeah definitely. Yeah. definitely. Well, how about we, we wrap it up here? I think we could probably keep going on forever, but we, we, we oh, should sure. do we should do a follow up uh, yeah, for eventually. Sure, but no, that was interesting. So um, we'll, we'll 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 wrap it up here, and um, and then hopefully there's a part two at some point. Yeah, maybe yeah, yeah, you, for sure, man. Maybe if you come down to Shenzhen, around, we're, we're drinking a little bit of whiskey here, yeah, but yeah. we'll change to beer when you're down in Shenzhen. Yeah, and man, I've uh, got some free time coming up, so I'd love that. You know, awesome, yeah, sounds good. And maybe we could go mobile, hit that bridge, man. I told you, yeah, yeah. Every time yeah, I go yeah. down there, I have yeah, to yeah. No, I go over to Hong Kong. I've got the cross border car. I go over to Hong Kong quite a lot, so let's definitely do that. Yeah, I'm down, man. Okay, cheers. Cheers. It was good talking to you.